Hello, everybody. <clears throat> Missing the Harvest Festival. Tuli went to the workshop to teach everyone how to bind books. I wanted to go and help, but let's shot me down. I would just be getting in the way. No arguing with that. Fran, is there anything that demands my attention before we go to the book room today? Not at all. Fran and Rosina were in the process of recording how much food the orphanage went through in a month and calculating how much would be needed for the winter. Meat and harvested crops from farming towns would soon be transported into the city as everyone began their winter preparations. We would need to have to at least need to have at least a rough estimation of how much we needed before then. This was the first time the orphanage would ever be doing their own winter preparations. I can visit the bookroom with Rosina if you are too busy to go yourself. It is fine. I was going to send Rosina to work with Wilma. And I can accompany you regardless of how busy I am, given that I can bring my own documents to the bookroom. Once Fran packed a board with a bag with a ton of boards and ink, we headed to the bookroom together. Bright sunlight that still had a trace of summer's warmth streamed into the chilly hall. As we walked, I could see the exit leading to the noble's quarter to, from the hallway, and there seemed to be several carriages lined up. Judging by all the luggage packed into them, some blue priests were probably heading out. Might I ask why those carriages are lined up? Has something happened? These are the carriages for Blue Priest heading to the Harvest Festival. Generally, Blue Priest goes to the Harvest Festival around this time of year. Harvest Festival? I haven't heard of this festival before. Autumn was a season of preparing for winter by gathering more in the forest while harvest from farming towns entered the market. I knew that there were tiny festivals in neighborhoods where everyone went off to butcher pigs together, but I had never heard of a Harvest Festival. Is it a fe special festival for the temple? I don't recall learning about it. Friend and the High Priest had taught me some of the rituals performed in the temple. And the Harvest Festival certainly wasn't one of them. Oh, do commoners not know of it? A sudden voice rang out from behind. I jerked in surprise and turned around to see a noble-looking man looking down at me with mocking eyes. He wasn't the blue priest I had met at the Star Festival, but since he wasn't wearing any blue robes, I couldn't tell if he was a blue priest or a noble that was visiting the temple on business. I immediately moved to a wall and knelt with my arms crossed in front of my chest. That was a sign of respect that those of lower status perform for those above them. I had been told I only need to perform it for the high bishop and high priest since all blue robes were equal, but I was still a commoner. I would rather play it safe and be respectful than get wrapped up in a fight after treating a noble as my equal. Hmm, looks like you do know your place. The high priest told the truth after all. I suppose I didn't need to get involved then. Dang it. God dang it. The noble, satisfied with how I had immediately knelt before him, walked off with a few commenters, a comments that left me a little curious. But anyway, it seemed I had managed to avoid trouble, given that he said I knew my place, that he was probably a blue priest. A normal noble would probably view any priest kneeling to them as normal. Sister mine, you are his equal heel. You mustn't kneel. You need to kneel. Technically, yes, but I am no noble. His status is still overwhelmingly superior to mine. If I can avoid trouble just by kneeling, I see no reason not to. Despite my reasoning, Fran still lowered his eyes with a look of vexation. If you do that, the other blue priest will look down on you, sister mine. I would expect nothing less. I am a commoner, after all. Would you prefer to me to earn their ire and put the orphanage in danger? Given that the blue priests knew I had earned my position through overpowering the high bishop with violence, they probably wouldn't attack me head on, but as I was the orphanage director, it was very possible that they could try to exploit the orphans to hurt me. I understand your reasoning, replied Fran, but I believe that it is important for you to show firm noble pride. He then resumed walking to the book room, looking disconcer discontented. But how could he expect me to have firm, noble pride if Fran wanted to serve a master that oozed confidence with a firm backbone? Well, I could try. But it wasn't so simple to just up and lean, learn to carry yourself with majestic grace. Allow me, sister mine, said Fran as he opened the door, but the second I stepped inside, I felt my expression freeze over. What the heck? The book room was an absolute mess. Two of the bookshelves were completely empty, the contents scattered on the floor, while such a, was such, which was such a mess of boards and scrolls that there was nowhere to step. This was clearly a level beyond someone dropping something by accident. Someone had intentionally knocked over everything on the shelves. I felt anger start boiling inside my chest. The book room existing at all was a miracle in this world that barely had any books or even things with words written on them. And yet they had defiled it, damaged it. I would need to smash those fools who didn't understand the value of these documents with the iron hammer of justice. <laughs> Just who would be foolish enough to do this, I wonder. A mana boiled throughout my body, and I encouraged it. Go ahead, catch the villain who did this and splatter the halls. 
Sister mine, we must first report this to the high priest. He will instruct us on what to do next. It might have been the last person to enter the book room, said Fran in a panicked voice as he grabbed under my shoulders from behind. The sight of him to trying to avoid being hit with my mana head on was enough to cool my head. I was finally learning to control my mana better. Nothing good would come from scaring Fran and hurting those uninvolved. I could save my anger and mana rampage for when I found the culprit. With a smile, I forced the mana back into its box. You're right, let us visit the high priest. As we hadn't scheduled a meeting, I waited in the visitor's room while Fran requested an audience. I could hear people moving around the hall as I sat quietly. They were probably the blue priest preparing to leave. The second I thought that, I remembered what the blue priest I had just met had said. I suppose I didn't need to get involved. If I remembered correctly, it was him! I immediately stood up. I couldn't just sit around now that I knew the culprit. He was getting ready to leave on some kind of trip. I had to catch him before he could get away. I grabbed the doorknob just as someone opened it from behind. The door swung in my direction out of nowhere, and I fell backward hard, swing, swung by the door. <laughs> Sister mine, what were you doing there? Fran had at his hand, looking stunned, and I pulled myself up with it. Once on my feet, I immediately tried running out of the room, only to be hurriedly grabbed from behind by Fran. What is wrong, Sister mine? I figured out who messed the book room up. If we hurry, we can still catch them in time. Let go of me. Please discuss that with the high priest. He is waiting for you. Fran hoisted me up into the air, murmuring that I would run off the second he let go of me. He then walked to the high priest's room without listening to my protests. Upon seeing Fran carrying me into his room, the high priest raised an eyebrow. What happened? Sister Mine attempted to run to the carriages after intuiting the culprit, so I had no choice but to carry her. Understandable. That was a very wise decision. <laughs> the high priest phrased Fran, and after gesturing for him to set me down, deaded his chin at the hidden room. At this point, it would be better to call it the lecture room than the hidden room. Well, it is a hidden room, but it's still a room you get lectured in a lot. I followed the high priest into the room while feeling a bit depressed about what awaited me. I moved aside documents and sat on the bench like always. Why does he always set bed stuff stuff on the dog on the bench when he knows you can sit there? Why can't he just leave it on his desk? And the high priest likewise brought over his chair like usual. He looked at me while rubbing his temples a little. I heard from Fran that the book room was vandalized. That's right. Two of the bookshelves were completely cleaned out. All the documents were spread on the floor so much that you couldn't even step anywhere. Is this not a crime worthy of death? Despite the desperation of my plea, the high priest shot me down with a wave of his hand. Don't be ridiculous. It's not worth the death penalty. But in any case, Fran sent you and the culprit. Yes, I met a blue priest preparing to leave the temple on my way to the book room, and he said I didn't need to get involved. It was definitely him. I see, but there are five blue priests departing for the Harvest Festival today. Which of those was it? There have been a lot of carriages, but I hadn't thought that there would be five whole blue priests leaving. I don't know, but I know his face. They will likely return for the festival in ten days. Will you remember him for that long? Asked the high priest doubtfully. I nodded hard. I will never forget the face of the he who attacked my books. Ever. It would be better for me if you did. The high priest glared at me with a sigh, but I wasn't about to let a criminal of this magnitude just get off scot-free. I went ahead and changed the subject. By the way, what is the Harvest Festival? I don't believe you explained it with summarizing all the temple rituals. Indeed, because you will not be participating. The Harvest Festival is held throughout farming villages in a region and was originally... The high priest began explaining the Harvest Festival. To briefly summarize the explanation, it was an event where taxmen and blue priests traveled to farming towns to snatch part of their harvest. The farming towns must hate the festival if their crops are taken as religious offerings and taxes. Do not put it so bluntly, and furthermore, they perform religious rituals at these towns. The high priest glared at me with a cough. It seemed I should have framed my observation more positively. As always, master of the nobility's roundabout way of speaking eluded me. Are these rituals held in the autumn, too? They are held after the harvest. Ah, I see. Farmers generally had no spare time from the moment the snow melted to the day they finished harvesting their crops. They probably had more free time than they knew what to do with once they were locked up for the winter, but no priest would want to wade through blizzards to hold any rituals. I kind of sucked that the rituals were performed right after taxes were taken, but it did make sense. Not to mention that if a couple does not participate in the starbine ceremony, they will not be recognized as husband and wife in the winter built in the winter building, and they will not be given a home or fields when spring comes. What's a winter building? The building where farmers spend the winter. Life in farming towns is very different from life in the city. During the summer, they live in individual homes located at the center of the, of the fields. But as they cannot farm during the winter, they pass time in a large building located within the center of town. I do not know much more about that myself, though. It seemed that living in a farming town was entirely unlike living in the city. I couldn't really picture their lifestyle from the explanation given, but if even the high priest didn't know the details, I probably didn't need to go out of my way to learn more. 
I don't participate in the Harvest Festival? Correct. There is a meeting held to decide who is sent where, and the High Bishop threw quite a fuss about not sending you anywhere, so you would not dig into his cut. Of course. I couldn't help but smile at how obsessively antagonistic the High Bishop was toward me. My days were so busy that I was on the verge of forgetting about him, but he seemed so mad as mad at me as ever. The other blue priests viewed the festival as a viable chance to boost their income, so they agreed with the High Bishop. Some farming towns were also far away, and it would weigh on your body to make such a thorough journey. The spring prayer will need your mana, but I saw no need to send you out for the harvest festival. Something about the High Bishop's explanation caught me, and I reflex reflectively tilted my head. Does that mean I'll be going to t farming towns once spring comes? Yes, you and I will likely be selected given our high quantity of mana. I knew that there was a spring prayer held to wish for a bountiful harvest, but I didn't know that it, held, it was held in farming towns. I don't think I would survive a long trip by carriage. I know it will be difficult, but this job is of vital importance. We accepted your conditions for joining the temple largely because rituals such as these require mana. Have you forgotten that? The temple accepted me as an apprentice blue shrine maiden specifically because they were experiencing a huge mana shortage. Given that they were letting me read books and even make them in the mine workshop, I couldn't abandon my duty when it finally came time to pay them back. I haven't forgotten. Good. It won't be easy for you, but please remember the suffering I will endure while accompanying you as your guardian and supervisor. Did you really have- do you have really bad luck, High Priest? Or were you just the kind of person that cares so much they make life hard on themselves? I swallowed down the observation that nearly slipped out of my mouth and shut my lips tight. Saying something like that would just be poking the hornet's nest. Still, I would rather go myself than risk entrusting it to another blue priest. Agreed. Thank you for con your consideration. I crossed my arms in front of my chest and bowed my head a bit. So, what do you intend to do about the book room? Asked the high priest, leading me to grin and clench my fist. Naturally, I'll be hosting a bloody carnival. What in the world is that? A festival of blood where the criminal was publicly executed. As they have made a clear declaration of war by vandalizing the book room, we will need to parade their head on a stick to restore the morale of our allies. The blue priest I didn't know the name of had given the most explosive decoration of war possible. If Fran wanted me to be firm and prideful, well, this was the perfect opportunity to show my backbone. I will not have it. The blue priest only vandalized the book room so that you would be too distracted to go to the harvest festival. He did not destroy any documents, and attempting to hold a festival of blood or what have you is nothing but dangerous extremism. I personally thought that my proposed punishment was equal to the crime. Too bad the high priest and I didn't see eye to eye here. All that just to stop me from going to the Harvest Festival, after they agreed not to send me to the meeting anyway. Yes, I suppose it would assume so. The documents there were organized by the date of their revival, and with no markings otherwise, they assumed you would be unable to clean up properly. Not that I remember every document stored there myself. The second I heard the High Priest say unable to clean up properly, a switch flipped in my head. The Blue Priest had declared war on me. In the form of a personal challenge. I wasn't about to let someone think I couldn't clean up the book room. I accept his challenge. What are you talking about? I will clean up the book room's documents myself. But as I do not know when each document was made, please be aware that I will organize them in my own style. Thinking about it, this was the perfect opportunity for me. It would be my best chance to turn the book room into a paradise designed specifically for me. Far be it from me to miss this opportunity to introduce a classification system to the book room. I'd organize the scrolls and boards by type, write up a catalog of everything there, and introduce order to the chaos. <coughs> all to make the book room easier for me to use, and after all, the book room was in such a bad shape that nobody else would want to clean it up. I could do whatever I wanted in there. Honestly, I kind of owed the culprit my thanks. Would it not be unfair to force someone else to clean up when the destruction was caused due to me? And I believe I used the book room more than anyone else. I find your sudden excitement to be off-putting. But it is hard to imagine that you will treat the documents poorly. Very well, I will leave cleaning up the book room to you. We returned to the high priest room, and once there, I made eye contact with Fran. He looked worried that I might have gone ballistic over that book room, but seeing him made me realize something. I was too short to reach the shelves, and even my attendants to help, Gil and Delia were too short as well. Fran would be stuck doing everything himself. High priest, might I recruit great priests from the orphanage to help clean the book room? Also, is there a catalog of swords for the book room? It would help to know what kind of documents are stored there. Hmm. That would be too much work for France, so certainly. I have a list of books I brought myself, but that is all. If such a catalog exists at all, the high priest must have it. Or the high bishop must have it. A list of books would definitely help classify them. I looked at the high priest with hope. May I borrow it? Certainly. Said the high priest, and Arnold speedily took out two wooden boards, which he then handed to me. He was as skilled of an attendant as ever. Oh, God. I know what 
is up with, between Arno and Fran, and oh my god. He hid that well! Thank you. Now, if you'll excuse me, I left the room, and once we were in the hall, Fran timidly spoke with confusion written on his face. Sister mine, you seem to be somewhat pleased. <laughs> That's because I am... Because I am so much so that I want to thank the culprit and the gods at once. May I ask why? I now have the opportunity to organize the book room however I like. Can you imagine anything more exciting than that, Fran? I can't. I had just finished reading the chain books and was thinking about moving on to the document stuff bookshelves. One could say that organizing them as I liked would be killing two birds of one stone. I finally get to act like a librarian, kinda. Heck <laughs> yeah, let's do it. The Mind Decimal System. Fran, please go to the workshop and squire three gray priests and summon all of my attendants except Wilma. What will you be doing, Sister Mine? I will look over the list that the high priest gave me and think about how to classify the books. Upon entering the book room, Fran cleared a path to, the, to a desk. He sat me down, placed the two boards the high priest lent us in front of me, and then speedily left to acquire our help. After seeing him off, I began looking over the list by myself. The list was written with small and compact letters that made it clear that the writer only cared if he could read them, not anybody else. Let's see here. The high priest brought... Whoa, what? There's so many! The high priest had brought an enormous number of books with him, half of the chain books and more documents that could fit on one on a shelf in one of the bookshelves. Just who is the high priest? All I knew for sure was that he was staggeringly rich. He said in the past that he entered the temple due to certain circumstances, but I can imagine his family was definitely on the higher echelon of status. If not for that, he couldn't have brought five books with him into the temple where each was worth multiple large gold coins. As far as I knew, books with hard leather covers, gold decoration, and gemstones fit into them weren't normally something that someone just owned. They were family treasures and the like, yet the high priest had brought five of them into the temple as his personal belongings and had opened them up for anyone in the temple to read them. That alone was enough to make my opinion of the high priest shoot up sky high. He's such a good person, I don't think many others would do this. Yeah, I kind of agree. My plan was to first roughly organize the books on the list, then organize the shelves based on how many documents of each category exist, but I hit a sudden wall. How should I classify books related to magic? Unfortunately, the Japanese version of the Dewey Decimal System didn't have a section for magic, but the High Priest had more documents related to magic than any other, maybe due to it being a field that only nobles were involved in, or maybe because they needed it for research? I tried writing out the categories used in the Japanese classification system. General works, philosophy, history, social science, natural sciences, technology, industry, art, language, literature. Considering that magic involved making magic tools, it would probably find, uh, fall under technology. Or maybe it would be better to treat it like math or a natural science. It was hard to introduce a decimal system into a world where life was so different. Anyway, I'll think about it after taking a closer look at the documents. I'm sure it'll be more clear once I see what they're like. I can't help but smile as I look at all the documents scattered on the floor. Because, I mean, this is magic we're talking about. How can my heart not beat fast at the mere thought of what's written in those scrolls? Everything outside of magic could be classified normally, so more. So once everyone got here, we would stack the documents first to clear up the floor. I would then mark the shelves with classifications and scan each document individually, putting it on whichever shelf that seemed to fit the best. Ideally, I would finish that by the end of today, which would let me spend the following days recording them in a catalog and creating more precise classification numbers. The second level of classification would probably need to be modified significantly to be usable here. Jeez, just what happened here? I heard a familiar shout and turned to see Delia in the doorway, her eyes flared open with anger. It was her job to keep my room clean, so naturally a mess like this would set her off. Behind her stood my other attendants and three gray priests, all of whom looked stunned at the state of the book room. Holy cow, murmured Gil. I don't know who did this, but I guess they want Sister Mine to kill him. <laughs> Gil knew how much I love books, and his observation made Fran press a head against his stomach. What's wrong, Fran? Does your stomach hurt? Somewhat, when I think of the culprit's future. I didn't expect Fran to be so worried about the culprit that he would feel ill. I put a hand on my cheek and tilted my head. Perhaps I should cancel the blood festival then. I thought it would be a perfect opportunity to show my firm backbone as a master and raise the morale of my allies, but if you insist... Well, Sister Mine... A blood festival's not going to pump anyone up. You're just going to scare everyone. My attendants and the great priest behind them all paled and collectively took a fearful step back. Only Fran walked up to me, knelt, and took both my hands to begin his plea. I beg of you, please cancel it. You have already shown the firmness of your backbone, sister mine. You think so? In that case, I will cancel the blood festival. We can focus on cleaning up today. 
Fred begged me to stop with such a serious look, I decided to cancel it after all. Cleaning up the book room would be a lot more fun than a blood festival anyway. First of all, take care not to step on any documents. Separate the parchment documents from the board documents and step them on this desk. Begin by picking them up in a way that forms a path to the bookshelves. They all replied understood, to which I nodded and continued my explanation. Fran and I will organize the gathered documents. Please line them up on the shelf according to the classification given. The top shelf and the left bookshelf will be zero, the second shelf one, and the bottom will be kept open. The right bookshelf's two top shelves will be two, and the bottom one will be three. The documents outside of these classifications will be organized last. You can line the documents up in any order you like, just be sure not to mix up the classification numbers. Fran sat next to me as the others went off to pick up the documents on the floor. He blinked in confusion, having been given a different job from everyone else. Sister Mind, what exactly is this classification system? Behold, this is the Mind Decimal System chart. Take a look at this and decide whether documents match which number. You can ask me if you're not sure. I'll help. I handed my diptych to Fran while explaining how it worked. Meanwhile, parchment and boards were stacked on the desk. Fran and I looked over them and organized them according to the most basic level of classification they fit into. Rosina, once a path is made to the left bookshelf, please place these documents on shelf one. I understood, Sister Mind. I had expected this, but many of the church documents were about philosophy. There were also a lot about history and the social science. My eyes were particularly drawn to documents listing the total harvest of farming towns, along with how much of the harvest was taken by the church. But they were all old, and I couldn't find anything more recent. Furthermore, I could find no documents about language or literature, not a single one. Delia, cried out Rosina, this is parchment within the scroll. There's parchment within that scroll. Be careful. Jeez, don't get in the way of my rolling, stupid parchment. He leaves shot at the parchment while I'm rolling the scroll, particularly partially out of embarrassment. Rosina giggled and picked up the piece of parchment that had ended up scattered across the floor. All scrolls were put in the same location, so we weren't classifying them despite looking at their contents. We would finally see the floor once again once the scrolls were picked up. Gil, please give these documents to the priest near shelf, too. The documents that had been scattered on the floor weren't books and had no uniform size. I saw a grey priest fighting with a piece of parchment. They kept falling over and concluded that it would be nice to have a filing cabinet or some such for everyone. We didn't even have any bookends. Maybe I should ask Johan to make some. Sister mine? Oh, it's nothing, Rosina. Just please give these book boards to that great priest. Tell him that he can push the parchment back with them. The book room still looked like a mess, but the valuable books within the lock shelf that could only be opened with the key from the high bishop or high priest had been untouched. Thank goodness. And the chain books hadn't been damaged or even scratched. The blue priest that did this really had just scattered the documents at a petty spite. The two empty bookshelves and the covered floor made it seem as if a huge number of documents had been scattered, but once the scrolls were rolled up and the documents stacked, there weren't really that many of them. Fred and I didn't have many boards and pieces of parchment to organize, categorize. I guess that's it. We finished organizing all the parchment and boards so fast I couldn't help but tilt my head in surprise. Yes, confirmed Fran, that did not take as long as I expected. Your classification system was very efficient. We just organized them based on the first level of classification. I intend to make more precise subdivisions to make specific documents easier to find. It will certainly be difficult to devise precision classification numbers for these documents, but it will be worth doing. Fran stood up smiling in relief, so I stood up as well and looked around. All the documents that had been on the floor were now stored on shelves, but the shelves I had reserved for the high priest's documents were both empty. I hadn't found a single one of his documents pretending to magic, despite everything having been picked up. Sister Mine, is something wrong? Fran's voice snapped me back to reality, and I saw the great priest lined up by my attendants awaiting further orders. It seemed they had, couldn't leave until I told them to, even though their work here was done. The book room has been cleaned up thanks to your efforts. Thank you all very ever so much. I greatly appreciate your assistance. Fran had to go return to the book, room's, the book room's key to the high priest, so I followed. I wanted to ask him about the magic documents. I did return the list he gave me, and I have a question to ask him. What might that question be? I couldn't find any of the documents recorded on the list. Maybe they're stored somewhere else? But if not, this could be a big deal. Fran paled. If all documents related to magic had been stolen by someone, I would be treated with the most suspicion given that I had chained up, cleaned up the book room. The fact that none of the valuable books had been stolen made me think the documents were probably fine, but being safe than sorry. I'd rather not see your face more than once a day, you know. Hey! The high priest get, gave a blatant grimace a second I entered his room. It's not like I'm coming here to see you, either. I protested on the inside while thanking him for the list with a smile. Hi, Priest. Thank you for lending me the list. You finished organizing the book room? That was faster than I expected. Remember the High Priest, but what did he expect? No way would I let precious documents run on the floor. I finished the first tier of classification. I will begin work on the second and third tiers in the coming days. By the way, I couldn't find the documents on your list. 
If you're storing them somewhere else, somewhere yourself, that's fine. But I thought I should report this just in case they were lost or stolen. That is to be expected, as those documents are in my room. But more importantly, mine, how did you know that only the documents listed here were missing out of that mountain of documents? I prepared a classification number for them, but the shelf for them ended up being empty. We were talking about real documents about magic, unlike anything I had seen before in my Arano days. Anyone excited about magic would notice that they weren't there. Not to mention the high priest said there was a mountain of documents in the book room, but I was so used to earth libraries that the book room seemed downright sparse to me. What do you mean by classification number? These are parts are part of the Mayan decimal system. They're used to organize books and documents. I took out my diptych, which still had the chart I drew to show Fran. I wasn't sure if I should classify the magic documents under technology or under natural science, and ultimately decided to wait until I had read them. Oh, this is quite an interesting system. Did you think of it yourself? The high priest narrowed his eyes, looking at me with suspicion. Uh oh. Honestly, his suspicion was justified. No way could I think of something as wonderful as this. No, I base this on the Japanese decimal system, which was in turn based on the Dewey decimal system created by Melville Dewey. I called it the Mind decimal system. Melville Dewey, who is that and where is he from? I've never heard of him. He died a long time ago and I've never even met him myself, but more importantly, what do you think magic should be classified under? I pointed at the diptych and asked the high priest about what number to classify magic under. He actually took the question pretty seriously and began thinking hard about muttering things like the fundamental magic of a aspect of magic is, and no, but where it comes to magic tools, one cannot forget that. I eagerly waited for his answer, and after a bit of waiting, the high priest suddenly snapped back to reality. He coughed and shook his head. I can't always say that it depends on the document, and in any case, it's not something for you to worry about. Yeah, because the stuff involving magic tools would be under technology, and anything else would probably be under natural science, depending on what it's about, is what he said, essentially. Why not? I can't organize them without giving them a classification number. The high priest slowly looked around the room and then placed the sound blocking magic tool in front of me. I gripped it and waited for him to continue. Only nobles wield magic. As the blue priests here have not graduated from the Royal Academy, the documents are not for their eyes. I have no intention of storing them in the book room. In short, the documents piled up in his hidden room were no doubt focused on magic. That made sense, but also seemed strange. The high priest made it sound entirely as if blue priests weren't nobles. Only nobles wield magic, but aren't blue priests nobles? Not exactly, no. Blue priests have the blood of the nobility and possess mana, but only those who graduate from the royal academy are accepted as nobles within noble society. What? But you said that a bunch of blue priests and shrine maidens were back to noble society. Maybe they were sent to the royal academy after being taken back? Though, according to what I had heard about the great priests in the Infernage, some of their former masters had been adult priests and shrine maidens. The Royal Academy temporarily allowed for them to be admitted due to how necessary it was to replace the enormous number of nobles killed during the Purge. This allowed for the status quo to be maintained. Given the influence of their families, blue <coughs> priests may appear identical to nobles despite not attending the Royal Academy. <coughs> but that isn't quite right. I had thought that anyone with noble blood would be a noble based both on my historical knowledge of blue nobility and how, and on how the blue priests carried themselves. But since one had to graduate from the Royal Academy to be a noble, not all blue priests were real nobles. You just can't be a noble if you don't graduate? That seems pretty harsh. I would disagree. Nobles wield the enormous power of mana. Ones so ignorant that they cannot control their mana, use it properly, or make magic tools can hardly be considered a noble. It's that simple. And it is for that reason that no matter how much you beg or plead, I cannot show you the documents, nor would I want to. That is the end of this. He finished his explanation that made it clear that he wouldn't budge on the matter. It seemed that the high priest knew all along that I had actually been hoping that he would show them to me. High priest! My answer will not change. Return to your chambers at once. He ordered with an ice-cold glare. I slumped my shoulders and left the room. <laughs> I wanted to see those magic documents. The high priest is just a big meanie. Well, he's got a reason to not show you, girl. What if you tried something and it went out of control or it went wrong and someone got hurt or worse? Best not to show you that until you can do it, you can actually control your mana and stuff. When I got back to my chambers, Tuli and Lutz were there, probably having finished their work. They were waiting for me in the first floor's hallway. Tuli Lutz, thanks for waiting. I sat in one of the chairs with them and after seeing Delia head to the kitchen to make tea, continued, did he finish the books? Only about half of them, those orphanage kids, haven't even held a needle before, said Lutz, to which Tuli nodded hard. He's not kidding. I couldn't believe that none of them had used a needle before. Which is bad, because they won't be able to fix their clothes if they get torn. Should I teach them how to sew, too? 
Those working in the workshop used the same second-hand clothes that the kids used when going to the forest. It wasn't uncommon for them to rip their sleeves and hems. But since they didn't know how to sew, they had no way of fixing their clothes, unlike kids from the lower city. It wasn't good enough It wasn't good enough to sew, my cl- sew myself, so I just had been thinking about using their messed up clothing as rags and buying new pairs. I'll get sewing kits ready if you're willing to teach, Tuli. I'm not allowed to work here, and I'm not good at sewing anyway, so... That's true. They definitely wouldn't get better with you teaching them. I think even just teaching them to sew the cuffs in their sleeves would make a difference, so, okay. Those sewing kits would be great. It seems probably hard for Tuli to believe that someone could grow up without learning to cook or sew, given how important these skills were in life. She looked like a cooking teacher worried about her stu- worried about her students. The orphanage kids can make their own soup thanks to you and, Effa t- you and Ella teaching them, and now you're moving on to sewing lessons. Maybe you should have been a teacher, Tuli. Do you want me to teach them or not? Tuli powered a little of being called a teacher, then lowered her eyes, but they know how to read a little. They were reading someone making the books. I didn't expect that little orphan kids would know how to read. They've been playing with the character set I made for them. You should play with them t- sometimes, Tuli. The character seemed to be teaching the kids to read somewhat effectively. Since I had put all the character words into the children's Bible, it would be easier for them to read. But it wouldn't be that easy to read for someone not in the temple. I wanted to show one to Benno and see what he thought. Lutz, do you have a book ready to give to Benno? Yeah, I got enough for everyone who helped us. Lutz held up four bound books proudly. Yes, thank yay, thank you. Let's go deliver one to Benno tomorrow. Yeah. We could basically just waltz into Benno's store whenever we wanted, and even if he wasn't there, we could give the books to Mark. But to meet with the high priest properly, I first had to write a letter requesting a meeting. Looks like I have to write another letter. Dealing with nobles proves to be a pain in the butt neck once again. Sister Mine, said Franz, shall I have Rosina write it for you? Despite asking a question, Franz's expression and the nuance of his timing made it clear he wanted to see whether Rosina could manage to write a proper letter yet. An attendant's duty involved writing letters for their master, and there would be no better practice than writing letters to the high priest. He would no doubt thoroughly correct any mistakes she might make and then send it right back to her. That sounds like a good idea. I shall leave it to her. Rosita twitched in fear, but tra- nodded with a graceful smile. I can really learn from her, I thought. Then noticed that Delia was looking at Rosina full of envy over her being given a new job. Gil was being given all sorts of new work thanks to him, his involvement with the workshop, and Franz work depended entirely on how active I was. Rosina wasn't skilled with paperwork, but she could manage it, and thus Fran was giving her increasingly large portions of his work. Delia probably thought she was being left behind, stuck in a rut of cleaning my chambers and not much else. She is working pretty hard to learn to read and do math. Though Gil learned faster since he had the orphanage kids to compete with. Meanwhile, Delia felt like she was, wasn't getting better no matter how hard she worked, which was honestly something I could sympathize with. I often felt like I wasn't getting any better and Les was leaving me behind despite both of us being the same age. Maybe I'm not praising her enough. It was easy to compliment Gil since he always asked for it whenever he did something. But Delia did her daily work without being without any big fuss at all, which made it hard to find opportunities to compliment her. Taking one's daily duties seriously was definitely important and impressive, but in the moment, it's kind of hard to say, thanks for continuing to do what you always do. Delia, I would like to deliver this book to the high priest later. Please store it in my desk, the, die desk drawer. Certainly, Delia took the book and then I gave her another one. Could you leave this somewhere in the hall? I would like for you to read it first and give me your thoughts before anyone else. Me first? Delia blinked in surprise. I nodded. Yes, Gil's working hard in the workshop, but my chambers would fall apart without you, Delia. I would like you to see the completed product first. That's right. It's all thanks to me. Delia lifted her chin high and raced up the stairs as her arms wrapped around the, around the books. Everyone watched her go with warm smiles. <coughs> my first fitting. I was wearing my apprentice outfit since I was going to the Gilberta Company today. Oh, wait. Shoot. Dang it. Do I want to continue? Yes, I want to continue. Okay, uh, did it go away? Go away. But since it and all my other nice clothes were fairly thin with long sleeves, they were naturally a bit cold for late autumn. The hooded poncho that Benno gave me last winter was serving me well here, but I didn't want to wear it for the rest of my life. I think it's about time to buy some winter outfits. You mean for when you go north? Asked Tuli, and I nodded. Nowadays, I only really spent a lot of time at home where I was bedridden, which meant I didn't need most of my normal clothes. But in return, I was going to the temple and the Gilberta Company all the time, and I would need fancy northern clothes to fit in. Invite me when you buy some. I'll definitely win this time. Oh yeah, Tuli and Lutz tied when trying to pick out clothes for me last time, I remembered. Ever since then, Tuli has started to look at clothes more carefully and wander around the city to observe fashion trends. Um, Tuli, I was thinking about going to get clothes today after getting Ben on his book. What? But I have work today. 
Julie helped out at the mine workshop yesterday since she had the day off, but since apprentices had work every other day, she couldn't go shopping today. I smiled at Tilly and put some finished picture books in my tote bag while she glared at me. Don't worry, I'll wait. We can go on a day we both have off since I need to get winter clothes for my attendants too. And you'll need a pair yourself since you'll be holding sewing classes in the orphanage, right? What? You'll buy one for me too? Despite how much Tuli was helping me, teaching the orphans to cook and sew, taking them to the forest and so on, I had never paid her for her work. Lutz was being paid a little extra for the Gilberta company to help me, not to mention his cut of what my new products earned. It was about time Tuli got rewarded for her efforts too. Thank you for your pay for being a teacher. <sighs> That's a bit much, but I'm not teaching them anything special. Tuli was pursing her lips and pouting, but she looked happy and her cheeks were blushing a little red. If she were happy, I was happy. I'll spend as much time as it takes to get a cute outfit for her. No cost is too great. Let's go, mine. Let's came to get me, so I grabbed my bag and went outside. I could feel how much cooler the air had gotten. Morning, Lutz, I see you've learned to love the poncho, too. Lutz was wearing his poncho, which happened to be a different color than mine. He had grown so much over the past year that he hated how tight it felt. But it seemed that even he could no longer stand the cold. I was just talking to Tuli about going to buy fancy winter clothes on the next day off we both have. Yeah, it makes sense. We need some clothes. Let's look down at his small poncho inside. By the way, I had grown a little. The poncho, which used to make me look like a bedsheet ghost, was now just a little baggy on me. All my growth was no doubt thanks to me constantly, consistently donating my mana, which led to far fewer instances of me collapsing from my devouring. I was as weak as ever, but collapsing less meant eating normal meals more often. Not to mention that at the temple, I always ate extravagant meals fit for the nobility. Collapsing less and eating my fill of nutritious food both led to me growing a little bit. Thank you, Le... Leyden Shaft, God of Fire and Ruler of Growth. Praise be to the gods! What the heck? Where'd that come from? Oh, sorry, it just kind of came out. It seemed that the customs of the temple were really rubbing off on me. Before I knew it, I was making the goofy praying pose in the middle of town without even thinking about it. I broke into an embarrassed sweat on all the passerby staring at me, and we hurried on to the Gilberta Company. Mark, there's something I want to show Benno. Is he here? Yes, the master is in his office. Please wait just a moment. Mark sorted things out and took us to Benno's office. Benno was sitting at his desk and blasting away at writing something. Good morning, Benno. I greeted him after his writing speed slowed down, and he set aside his pen to greet me back. He then looked at Lutz while scratching his stretching his back. Understood, Master Benno. Lutz must have understood what that look meant, so he told me to sit down and then disappear behind the door that led to Benno's floor of residence. What was that about? He went to tell a servant to start getting tea ready. Benno walked to the table where I was. He wasn't making a big deal about it, but that was the first time I had seen Lutz climb the stairs behind the door. Is he allowed to go up there? He's a laharl, you know. He's still living at home and only eating lunch here, but once he's an adult, he'll be living here just like Mark is. Oh, I see. Since I ultimately didn't become an apprentice merchant, I didn't have a clear idea of what Lahar how laharls and lahanges differed. I was just thinking of one as a contract employee and the other as a future administrator. How do you know so much and so little at the same time? <laughs> it's a gift. Benno sighed in exasperation right as Lutz came back. Lutz faltered for a bit, not sure if he should stand behind Benno or beside me. You made this of me, Lutz, so sit next to me this time. I patted the chair beside mine and Benno nodded. Lutz sat next to me and gave a small smile. So, what have you got for me? Ta-da! This! A picture book for kid, book Bible for kids. You finished it, huh? Uh... Okay. You finished it, huh? Benno murmured in disbelief and took the picture book I held out to him. He took looked at the front, the back, and narrowed his eyes at the string, binding it all together. You're keeping it together with a string? You aren't using any glue? We haven't made any high glue yet. I thought about making some starch glue, but that would raise the base price even more, and the orphanage kids didn't want to waste the flour on it. They said they would rather eat it than use it to make glue. It was hard for me to argue with that, given how I had seen them starving to death not too long ago. Benno felt the plants in the front cover. Not often you see book cover not made of letter. This is the same kind of flower paper you made for me a while back, yeah? Yes, I put a little extra effort into it since it's the cover. I think it would be even prettier with some coloring. I thought of getting pigments from fruit, but the orphanage kids always prioritize eating. In the first place, the kids started working since they wanted to have enough to eat. Food was naturally more important to them than books. This time I had them prioritize finishing the books, but in the future I would need to search for pigments that I could get from inedible fruits, plants, stone, and bark. You did this much with just black and white? Asked Benno while opening up to the front page. Woman's art was prior positioned such that it was the first thing you saw when you opened the book. Benno widened his eyes and looked at the art. It starts pretty impressive. How'd you get this done? <laughs> I cut thick paper with a precision knife and cut put ink on top of it. That's called stenciling. Woman worked hard to learn this new art style. Isn't it? Is she amazing? 
I puffed out my chest with pride for my attendant, but Benno just created his head for some reason. An entirely new style of art. You just keep making new things without telling me. Now, now, Benno, you don't need to get so upset. Plant paper itself is so new that it really it doesn't matter what else I introduce here. Books made with parchment already existed, but this is the first time plant paper was being used to make books. Fine complain about me about me tacking on a new style of art on top of that. It doesn't matter? Seriously? I mean, I'm using newly developed ink on new plant paper with art drawn in a new style and printed on paper using new technology that ultimately gets bound together in a new bookbinding technique. This picture book bible, if kids, is built on a mountain of new inventions. Honestly, no part of it isn't new. Bannon looked at the book with a grimace, then scratched his head. Now I've got a headache. But anyway, what are you going to price it at? Considering that we need to cover for the initial investment, I was thinking a small gold and five large silvers would be a fair price. The initial investment would matter less and less the more books we make, so ultimately the price would settle down to about eight large silvers. We gathered the soot this time ourselves, but consistently making ink from soot would cost money. Considering the initial investment, the cost of materials, the cost of labor, and the handling fees, a small gold and eight large silver seemed like the best price to go with. That was on the cheaper side, too, since we were using the paper we made ourselves without going to Benno. Oh? Volume paper would get cheaper, too, once more of it's in the market, right? That'll lower the price of the books, too. But ink? Well, no helping that unless linseed oil gets cheaper. The books are just going to be expensive, I said, with defeat, but Benno shook his head slowly. This kind of book that nobles buy run from four to five large gold. Yours are a lot cheaper. Dirt cheap, even. And they're good for kids since the rising is so easy to read. You can add a leather cover if you want it to look more fancy, too. I was just personally more concerned about the quantity and quality of the contents than the cover. Books were expensive enough that you had to be as rich as a noble to buy one. But if they were made even a little cheaper, there, there would be status-hungry people out there ready to seize the opportunity. And particularly vain, rich people would no doubt jump on them if we added on some fancy covers. Makes sense. Rich people would definitely want these. Do you have any plan to make other books? I intend to make several more picture books like this. Carving out stencils for the words is hard enough that I want to keep the text short. Also, my artist has very limited experience. She's a caged bird who's never left the temple and can basically only draw religious figures. Things were getting better in the orphanage now that they were making their own soup, but most of them still didn't really understand what uncooked food looked like, and they still lacked a lot of things important to living life outside the temple. The lack of baskets and knives for going to the forest made that clear, not to mention sewing kits and all that. That's pretty extreme. Her upbringing was just that different. Right now, she, the best thing for her is to keep drawing what she's best at. I just need to think of stories that allow for that. Which shouldn't be hard since there's a ton of stories about the gods. True, but if you stick to just religious stuff, it'll get pretty boring, interjected Let's. I shrugged. The orphanage kids liked religious stories the best, but people in the city didn't seem to like them at all. If it comes to making books with just text and none of Wilma's art, there's two possible things I want to make first to help with mass production and efficiency. Yeah, and what are those? First, the stencil paper from the mimeograph. You have to make a sheet of plant paper thin enough to be seen through, then cover it with a super thin layer of mixed wax and resin or something, but to be honest, it requires an extremely high level of skill to manage that. And since we don't have any machines for it, I think we'll need to get the help of a wax workshop at the very least. I really didn't expect making stencil paper to go smoothly. It would no doubt be a painful journey of forking over filled pieces of plant paper Going through a normal trial and error involving the ratio of mixed waxes and utterly failing to get the proper thin coating over it all. But if we get it done, things would be a lot easier for us. One could just cat the letters directly into the stencil paper with a sharp pen, no carving out necessary. Wax, huh? That's not going to happen this season. The workshops are too busy. Agreed. The other thing is movable type printing. I'm still thinking about whether I should start making the stencil paper or if I should start making punch letters for movable type printing. What's the problem with that one? The Benner looking confused, as did Lutz. Making letter punches would be easy with Johan from the Smithy's help, but movable type printing requires so much arm strength, as much arm strength as using a compressor, it would be a little rough for the orphanage kids. The printing presses were named as such since you literally had to press down with force to get the printing done. Movable type printing would require a lot of hard manual labor. Making the stencil paper for the mimeograph will be hard, but once it's ready, even children will be able to do the printing without much effort. Huh, this is a tough one. Both Benno and Let's cross their arms and fell into thought. But, well, either way, I'll need to save up money before I can do anything. I've already spent a lot of my savings on this. I won't be able to earn anything off of these books either since they're going to be textbooks for the orphanage. What? 
You're not going to sell them? What the hell are you thinking, mine? Benno blew up at me while I was wondering if the orphanage's winter handiwork would be enough to earn my money back. I jerked in fear and blinked multiple times. It's not that complicated, Benno. I won't be able to use them as textbooks if I sell them. Why would you make something you can't sell? They'll make big money. Sell them. No way. I'm going to use them as textbooks, and they're a wonderful investment for the future since they'll raise the literacy rate. I'm just planting the seeds to grow future customers. To grow future customers here. Uh, why don't they mention that she could make more than just like 30 copies of that, that Bible, essentially, and make more that she can sell and still keep the others as textbooks? Why can't they do that? Hello, mass production here. This winter will be an important time for seeing how well holding school sessions in the orphanage will go. I wouldn't sell my textbooks before the big moment. Really, I wanted to buy as many stone slates as calculators as I can get my hands on, but despite my best attempts to explain myself, Benno just shook his head with an exhausted expression. I just don't get you. In the first place, we don't know how well people will take to these picture books, do we? I think that religious stories haven't really worked their way into the mainstream since most people just hear at them at the temple once or twice, and then that's it. At that point, it would be better for me to just make new picture books more suitable to the public and sell those instead. We would, make, we would make way more money that way. I would rather start making new picture books that could sell than let Benno take away my textbooks. New picture books, said Benno, interested. You already thought of the next story, asked Lutz. Well, Benno and Lutz looked pretty surprised, but I had a huge stash of stories hidden away in my head. It's just not, not all of them match the art that Wilma could draw. I think that a story about a princess could work since Wilma served a noble that was basically like a princess. I'll write down a rough draft and see what the high priest thinks before making it into a picture book. It shouldn't be too hard to make a picture book based on Cinderella. Sister Christine will probably be a good model for basing the princess on. The prince could be... Well, since all attendants accompanied their masters to the noble quarters during the Star Festival, Wilma will probably figure something out. She must have seen someone princely in her time there. Guess we can talk about this once it's made. So how much do I gotta pay for this book? That's a gift from me to you, for all your help, so no money necessary. But, well, I looked up at Benno's faltering and his lips curved into a slight grin. What do you need this time? I want to go shopping for winter clothes the next day Thule has off. Please take us to a second-hand clothing store. Yeah, sure, I'll make sure Marker I have time off that day. Anything else? That's Benno, prompting me to take out and open my diptych. This is about butchering the pig meant me in the orphanage, but we all need salt and spices, right? What should I get ready and how much? I don't know anything about butchering since I've always been stuck in bed when it happens, but since it's the first time the orphanage will be doing it, we need to get the tools and everything ready. That'll cost you. Do you have enough? Benno narrowed his eyes at me. I looked back at his dark red eyes and gave a firm nod. I'm prepared to dump all my trauma paper earnings on this. I had established a workshop in the temple to increase the li proof of the lives of those in the orphanage. Far be it from me to worry about spending the money on its intended purpose, not to mention that the money was earned by their labor in the first place. All right, I'll get, get, I'll get what you need, but to be clear, I'm going to be putting the men over there to work. My staff can't do everything on their own. That's fair. Oh, and how are my ceremonial robes coming along? Right. Karina was saying that she wanted to do a first fitting with you. Benno stood up immediately and went to his desk. There he rang a bell to summon a maid who he asked for Karina's plans. If you've got time, mind, go over to Karina's today. The servant said that she would summon me whenever everything was ready and then went back upstairs. You can get back to work if you need to, Benno. That's all I needed to talk about. Benno, as the head of a successful store with a lot of logistics to keep track of, was especially busy at this at the time for winter preparations approached. I couldn't ask him to entertain me forever, despite our discussions having ended. I discussed the story of Cinderella with Lutz while, walk, while waiting and started writing out the, the text to my next picture book. Eventually, I heard a bell ringing somewhere. Benno looked up, told Lutz to take me to Karina, and then looked back down. Lutz took me through the door in the back of Benno off, Benno's office and up the stairs to where Karina lived. Mrs. Karina, it's Les. I brought mine. Hello there, mine, and thank you, Lutz. After watching Les leave, I looked at Karina. She was wearing looser clothing from last time, a style that wasn't tight around her belly. That made her belly look a little bit, a bit bigger than it might have otherwise. Good to see things were going well. This embroidery is quite lovely, isn't it? Karina had drawn large lines for cutting the blue cloth, along which flowed embroidered water with flowers of all seasons stitched in as well. It's so pretty. Now this is for your first fitting. Please try it out. I want to see if there will be a problem with the length. I put on a first fitting outfit made from different cloth than the actual outfit. It fit me perfectly, which made sense given that she made such precise measurements before. But a perfect fit meant that I would grow out of the robes in no time if she made them at this size. See? I am getting bigger. <laughs> 
Trina, I would like for you to make it longer than this. I would like to have leeway to fold the hem and such so that I can keep wearing them even after growing. I grabbed the hem of my skirt and folded it up, which made Karina tilt her head. As you did with your baptism ceremony outfit? But would such frills be welcome on ceremony or robes? I only did that so I could wear clothes made for Thule, but it's the same idea. You can't really sew on new cloth to make it longer after you've cut it short, right? You don't have to make frills from the folds. You could just take the hem, shoulders, and so on, and then fold and sew them. I spoke while squeezing my, sh my sleeves, which made Karina blink in confused surprise. Why not just order another one when this one no longer fits? We must consider changing fashions, and the ill-fitting clothes won't look so pretty. Kimonos for kids had tucks in the waist and shoulders so they could keep wearing them while growing, but in general, the style here was to sell clothes that couldn't fit to buy new clothes. Long-term use wasn't viewed as important, but I beg to disagree. That's what nobles would do, maybe. They can just buy as many of their expensive outfits as they want, no matter how much they grow. It was just coincidence that Benno had given some of his best cloth for the temple as a gift. I had skated by just paying for the dyeing and the commission itself. But in the future, I would need to custom order cloth to be woven from thread, which would ba balloon cost enormously. I didn't have the money to buy pair after pair of ceremony clothing that required extremely expensive fabric. A fair point. It seems my sense of context has been skewed since I only ever used this expensive cloth while making clothes for nobles. You are indeed not a noble mind. I don't think fashion trends will matter much for a simple pair of ceremonial robes, so please focus on making them long-lasting. Karina nodded with understanding. In that case, could you teach me these methods you were discussing? Do you know how to fold the clothing in a way that does not harm the appearance? After that, we talked about how broad to make the tucks and how to make the outfit long-lasting, which marked the end of my first fitting. Oh no, I think Tuli might cry if I tell her I had my first fitting without her. Oh. Okay. I think it's going to be it for this one. I'll see y'all next time.